and that's even more promising. Okay, good morning everyone, thank you so much. That's a really embarrassing bit, that introduction bit, but uh, uh, thank you also for the welcome here. I feel really very impressed. Uh, I also feel at home because, uh, uh, like Juliet, I'm very much an up-close-and-personal kind of researcher. Um, spent my time originally in industry and then came into the academic world. These days, a lot of my research is uh, in an interesting place. Uh, I work a lot with the humanitarian sector. So if you think about organizations like Save the Children or the Red Cross, innovation there really is sometimes a matter of life and death. So it's a space where innovation matters hugely and learning how to organize and manage it is a key question. So that's particularly where I'm coming from. I'll use a couple of examples in my talk. <clears throat> but what I really want to do today is just kind of set the scene within which we might explore university, industry, government relationships and how much they need to change. Uh, I will particularly talk from the perspective of organizations. I work a lot with companies, so I'll draw a lot on that. But what I hope I can do is give a flavor for the kinds of questions which I suspect will weave their way through the rest of the conference. Uh, I have an assistant I'd like to bring on stage to help me with all of this. Ladies and gentlemen, please meet the Red Queen. Now, if you don't recognize the Red Queen, she's actually a wonderful character in Lewis Carroll's books, Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. And the Red Queen is particularly interesting in all sorts of ways. However, one thing I would recommend is if ever you come across the Red Queen, please don't try and play chess with her. Why? Well, for three reasons. Number one, she keeps changing the rules, which isn't very helpful if you're trying to play a game of chess by the rules. Uh, number two, she also keeps changing the game. You might think you're still playing chess, but she's moved on to something else. But those two pale into insignificance compared to the third problem, which is that in her world, this is perfectly normal. Now, there's a wonderful piece in the book, if you haven't read it, wonderful scene where they've been running like mad, <sighs> puffing and panting, and eventually they pause. And Alice said, oh, you know, in our country, you'd, you generally get somewhere if you've been running as fast as we have for as long as that. To which the Red Queen replies, rather imperiously, huh, that's a slow sort of country. Now here, you see, it takes all the running you can do just to stay in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run twice as fast as that. Now, I think you can see where I'm going with this. It's a metaphor. But I think a powerful metaphor for where we are today in this world of innovation. Because basically, the problem hasn't changed. My definition of innovation, my working definition, is very simply, how do we create value from ideas? Now, it could be commercial value. Increasingly, we're concerned about social value. But how do we create value from ideas? That problem never changes. But the context in which it, changes, it happens is changing all the time in ways which are both challenging and offer opportunities, providing we can work with them. So we're really in a world, and this will come up many, many times, it was already, I loved your, some of your research questions, your themes, I like uh, shopping to oblivion, I'm going to remember that one. But we're in a world where we've got multiple simultaneous sources of change. In that kind of world, you know, we can't trust to luck, we have got to manage innovation. And of course, the big word in all the studies around strategic management, especially innovation, is dynamic capability. And I interpret that as meaning not just learning to do something, a capability, but having the second order ability to step back and reset the way we approach things. And for me, this is really rather important because I'm long enough in the innovation game now to realize the models we had back in the 1970s and 80s are no longer relevant. We've got to keep updating them. I was very lucky to work alongside somebody called Roy Rothwell. Any of you interested in innovation, really, if you haven't yet come across Roy's work, please look. Roy was a fellow at Sussex for very many years, and he wrote a great paper in 1992 talking about multiple generations of thinking about innovation, innovation models, which inform policy and practice. Moving from those simplistic linear models we had in the 60s, which are really ridiculously out of date and don't explain things, to increasingly interactive ones. And essentially what Roy was saying is we need innovation model innovation. We talk a lot about business model innovation. As scholars and as practitioners, we need innovation model innovation. So just to remind you, and this is the plug for the book, um, but you don't have to look at our book, any other book or any other consultant will give you some version of this. How do we manage innovation? Well, it's not an accident. 
if we're serious about it, we need to think in terms of a model that looks something like this. First of all, it's not bing, the light bulb. It's not that magic flash of inspiration. There's much more to it. It's a process. It's a set of things that happen over time. <coughs> it's got a sort of funnel shape at the front end. How do we pick up all the signals and do we look for the signals that might trigger the process? Then we've got to choose. We can't do everything. So out of all the things we could do, which ones will we do and why? Uh, we have then the small problem of actually doing it. And of course, innovation is all about uncertainty. So we don't know if it's going to work until we try. So there's that whole sort of process to be managed there, which is much more than just project management. It's influenced by, do we have a sense of strategic direction? Is there some clear idea of why we're doing this and where is innovation going to take us? And it's also about people. Fundamentally, it's about people, their creativity, their knowledge, and their cooperation and collaboration. These days, and this is very much the open innovation story, we get that really it's always been a multiplayer game. So if we're going to manage it, we should be actively, proactively building links out there to all sorts of players. And the green bit is the kind of optional extra. If we're smart, we also develop a reviewing capability to say, OK, nobody starts with a perfect one of these. We learn, and we can adapt and change. We can innovate our innovation model. But that's a fairly typical picture. You'll find it in anyone's book. If you pay McKinsey lots and lots of money, they'll tell you the same thing. So that's the kind of view we have of innovation. And it distills to some key questions I suspect any organization ought to be asking itself regularly. Have we got that blue arrow? And are those mechanisms effective in making that happen? Have we got a strategy? Are we any idea why we're doing this? And do we have support from, that, uh, from people for that strategy? Have we got the innovative organization which gets the best out of people and their ideas? Have we got these rich, proactive links? And do we learn and build capability? Now, all of that fairly obvious, but it's important because organizations have a tendency to get locked into a model because it's worked. And it becomes comfortable. And it's often hard to change that. Here's a little map. Um, very, very simple. You can see the way those axes work. Left to right, as you go left to right, it's basically moving to a world of more uncertainty. So there's all sorts of things going on over here. Technical change, organizational change, market change. Life is just more uncertain over here. And the vertical axis, how far could we get away with doing what we've always done? Now, of course, if you say to anyone, where's your organization on this? They say something like this. Well, it's obvious. You've got to keep changing in this turbulent world. We can't stand still. You get one or two who say, actually, we get that, but they don't. If we're smart, we could use this new technology, or these new market conditions, or these new social shifts. We can use that to create advantage. But most people, if you ask them about this map, are going to put themselves somewhere above the line. Of course, as innovation scholars, we know it doesn't work that way. That there are lots of organizations, forget the stupid ones that don't want to change, lots of smart organizations that find themselves in trouble. And we could spend the next hour talking about examples of spectacular failures sometimes. My first job, I was a lab assistant at Kodak in Harrow. Kodak's a great example of an organization which believed in innovation, which wrote the rule book. George Eastman essentially brought photography from the specialist professional to everybody. So wonderful, did a Henry Ford on photography. And yet, as you see, Kodak not dead yet, but in deep trouble. The challenge I suggest here is the inability to reset and extend the innovation model. Nothing wrong with the model, but the one that got you above that line <coughs> may not keep you there. So we need this capability to review. And that's what I really want to focus briefly on, because it's a challenge not just for the organization, but for all of the players in the system. <coughs> I think, having been in universities a long time, we are locked in very old-fashioned models, because they're comfortable and we kind of think we understand them. The fact is, there's an awful lot going on out there which open up new challenges and new opportunities. So how does innovation happen? Well, I know with this kind of audience, you already knew what I put up. It isn't just the brilliant idea. We need some kind of process to make it happen. Now, I'm very comfortable with that, except that that, of course, is not how innovation happens. That's just a simplification that helps us talk about it and think about it. The reality is, innovation doesn't happen like that. It happens like that. Now, don't worry if you can't see detail. That's quite deliberate. I would like you to see spaghetti. 
because that's what innovation really is. Knowledge spaghetti. It's technical knowledge, market knowledge, legal knowledge, financial knowledge, all sorts of strands of knowledge held by all sorts of different people inside and outside the organization. And the job we have, if we want to innovate, is to weave those strands together to create value. Now, we can superimpose structures on this, that's fine, as long as we don't forget what's actually going on underneath. And that also then begs the question, maybe we should look for different ways of working with that spaghetti. So, the characteristics of this, and I'm not going to go into great detail, but the characteristics of this, if you like my knowledge spaghetti world, first of all, it's always been a multiplayer game. These days, it very much is a story of open innovation. Now, we've been talking about that for 20 years nearly, but really, that's a key thing to get our heads around, just how much of a multiplayer game this is. Um, and the big shift, if I take the view of the sort of 20th century versus the 21st, the big shift is we had a rather static model in the last century. We're now very much concerned with knowledge flows, knowledge dynamics, and how does that all happen? That's a very different approach, and it requires very different models to deal with it. It's, of course, hugely about connection and interactivity. Increasingly, we're realizing inside the organization, especially large organizations, it isn't just about the specialists doing innovation, the R&D group or the business development group. It's spread and diffused through many, many more people. It's also not about pushing the knowledge frontier all the time. One of the great things about this kind of model of knowledge flows is reusing knowledge that's been hard won in one world and bringing it across somewhere else where it has relevance. It's a rich, hugely rich opportunity, but how do we make it happen? And that's very much been the research agenda for the last years, one that I know from looking at some of the papers you're also concerned. It's not a simple matter. There are all sorts of opportunities, but we've got to work them out. So what we really need are new models of innovation, multiple models of innovation that can operate in parallel with each other, rather than one size somehow struggling to fit all. Now, here are business schools, so we need our two-by-two two matrix. So here's my version of that, but just a simple notion of where this is all going. If we basically put innovation on that vertical axis and our incremental to radical sort of distinction, I think we all understand that. And on our bottom axis, just try and get a sort of flavor for what's going on out there, all that huge complexity in the environment. Well, most organizations put a frame around it, a selection environment, the things they pay attention to, the technologies they watch, the competitors they manage, the markets they listen to, they kind of frame it. And within that, the models we've talked about for a long time can work. We're talking about incremental innovation in a world we know. Well, that's mainly a challenge of managing exploitation. Should be able to do that. And we know how to extend, particularly in uh, sort of R&D developments, you know, how we can push our knowledge frontiers in a controlled way. It's still risky, but we can manage that. Fine, we've got models that work for that, and they're reasonably robust. I'm happy to teach those because they will work. The challenge, of course, is what else? Because there's all sorts of other things we can bring into this frame. All sorts of other things are forcing themselves into our uh, frame. And what we need there are multiple different models. We don't know what they are. They may not be the same shape. They've got to do the same kinds of jobs. And that's really the space that I think this conference is engaging with. It's a space that any smart organization, public sector, <coughs> private sector, government, university, or business, that's a space they need to explore. So what I want to do is very, very briefly, looking at the clock, and please keep me to time, because I'm conscious you've got a lot of good stuff to come. Um, what I'd like to do is just surface some of the strategies, some of the ways in which organizations that I'm familiar with are beginning to try and play with this, are beginning to experiment with those new complementary parallel models. And the first of these strategies is variety matching. Now, when I trained as an engineer a very long time ago, I learned all sorts of systems theory, which is very helpful, including Ashby's law of requisite variety. And basically what Ashby's law says is, in a complex world where there's lots and lots of things going on, you can't bring a simple lens up to it and hope to deal with it. You need to try and match that variety. That's a very tricky thing to do, but it really means you've got to look for ways of mobilizing a number of different perspectives on this challenge. Now, let me give you an example of mobilizing mind. I want you to come in my time machine for a moment, way, way back 
to the very early 17th century. Okay, so quite a long way back in time. And particularly to the Admiralty in London, where there is a very worried set of men, I'm afraid no women were involved at that time, but a worried set of men, the Admirals, worrying about a big problem for the Navy. We keep losing our ships. Now, that's not a good thing for any Navy. Uh, it's particularly worrying because sometimes those ships disappear and so do the men on board. And tragically, the reason we're having this meeting is that a squadron of ships thought they were landing in Plymouth Harbour, but were in fact not. They were running aground on the rocks of the Scilly Isles about 50 miles to the west. Now, this is the problem. We cannot navigate accurately. That's a huge issue. And the reason is actually quite simple. We understand the problem. We can't tell the time. We can measure latitude, but the thing we can't measure accurately is longitude. And you need those two to know where you are. Now, telling the time requires an accurate timepiece that's portable, that you can put on ships. And we didn't have one. So what they did was a very interesting plan. They said, well, we don't have the answer, but maybe somebody does. Let's ask. So this is a really early example of an innovation contest. They put up a big prize, getting on for a million pounds in today's money. They got the king to back it, so that helps, and basically put out the challenge. Can anybody solve this problem? And if you pop down to Greenwich at some stage, if you're here, um, in the Naval Museum, you'll see the answer. This is a beautiful piece of engineering, mostly made of wood, by the way. It's made by a man called John Harrison, and basically it's the portable chronometer that won the prize and did the job. It helped the British Navy navigate. But to do that, you needed huge organizational resources, get the king himself involved. This is not something you can easily do. Across the channel, same sort of thing going on. Emperor Louis Napoleon III knows what his grandfather taught him, an army marches on its stomach. Trouble is that its provisions have a tendency to go bad, and that's a big challenge if you're the quartermaster. And butter is one of those problems. So what we need for the French, the new French army, is a, a, a manageable substitute for butter. And that, believe it or not, is where we get the wonderful product margarine from. Now, whether you like it or not, in any supermarket, there's a lot of cabinets with margarine. And the origins were, again, an innovation contest. But the same thing, it takes a huge amount of organizing. You need the emperor himself involved. This isn't easy, except that today it is. This afternoon, if we wanted to, we could already be running an innovation contest. There are hundreds of software platforms that help us do it. We can ask all sorts of people. Basically, we can tap into many, many minds. We can mobilize those minds to deal with problems that not all of our organization, not all of our people are able to deal with. Of course, it's not just contests. There are all sorts of other ways to work with this using the crowd. Uh, if you've not come across them yet, Innocentive.com is a great example, one of many, many innovation markets. The principle is very simple, it's eBay for innovation. On the one side of the marketplace, there are seekers, I'm looking for a solution to a problem, and on the other, solvers. And the thing about solvers is, they're people who think they have... Right, come on in. The thing about solvers is, they think they have a solution to your problem. And anybody can play, it's just like eBay. So you have a nine-year-old schoolboy, 90-year-old retired engineer, anybody can play. Now these are rather interesting things for a couple of reasons. First of all, they're big. Innocentive has about a quarter of a million regular solvers. Now imagine having an R&D department of a quarter of a million. Now that's already a very interesting phenomenon and it's stable and robust over many, many years. Karim Lakhani at Harvard Business School has made a great study of Innocentive. But the really interesting thing coming from his research is this is not then a way for companies to say, oh, we don't need to do R&D, we'll just crowdsource it. It's what else you can do. So they still do their R&D, but the things they would post on this platform are those really tricky problems they've wrestled with for ages that they can't get an insight on. But if you've got a quarter of a million people, they're not all the same as you. You've got this huge distribution of perspectives, and it's there that the real value comes. You're spreading the net so much more widely, you're getting new insights. Of course, we're all familiar with this kind of thing. If you look at your smartphone, it's a wonderful piece of telecommunications, but the real power is, of course, the platform across which hundreds of thousands of developers have written apps for millions of users. It's the same principle, and I could go on with many other examples. 
That's one of the things we're now seeing as a strategy. How do we spread our knowledge net much more widely? <coughs> the second one is a real sort of resurgence of interest in entrepreneurship. And one of the things about that is the, this wonderful word bricolage, this French word, which is mixing and matching. Entrepreneurs are rather good at improvising, making things happen out of nowhere. And in this rich knowledge space where it's all very widely distributed, this is quite powerful. I'd like you to meet one of my heroes. Um, this is a guy who's a hero of mine for two very good reasons. One, he works in the social innovation space and has had huge impact. <coughs> the second is he didn't even start doing that till he was older than me. He's a classic silver entrepreneur. He gave the later years of his life to trying to solve a social problem. He spent all his life as an eye surgeon in India treating cataracts. Now, cataracts, if you know this awful thing, gradually something develops over the lens and eventually blocks the lens. Two cataracts and no treatment, and you go blind. <coughs> it's not actually a complex operation. I say that advisedly. In my local hospital, we have a simulator. I have actually done a simulated cataract operation. You basically cut out the cataract, but of course you take out the lens, so you then have to insert an artificial lens and make sure the eye doesn't get infected. So it's a fairly straightforward operation. The real problem, and the problem he saw, was the problem is economics. The people in the hospitals he ran could afford the treatment. But the economics are basically, in Mumbai and where he worked, about $300 for the operation. If you have the operation done in the Brooks Hospital here, you're probably talking about $3,000. People skills in a very narrow <coughs> area. So the Aravind Eye system, which is what this guy developed, essentially is a very different approach, borrowing from McDonald's, who in turn borrowed from Henry Ford. It's a kind of manufacturing model. Very different. You imagine you've got a hospital which may not be a physical hospital. You may have a tent because you've taken the hospital to where it's needed. The patient is prepared, anesthetized and sterilized by somebody just narrowly trained in that one area, wheeled in where the expert, the surgeon, does an operation which may take minutes. And then they're gone and they're looked after, and most important, the infection is uh, kept out by someone else who's been trained narrowly but specifically by which time a new patient, they're gone, a new patient, it's a factory. It's a factory, but it works. My medical friends in England say, you can't do that, but actually you can, and it works very well. One measure of quality is infection rates. They are lower in the Aravin clinics than in most European hospitals. So it's safe. More importantly, it's low cost. He reckoned to get this operation to work for the people he was targeting, he needed to have a target price of $30 per operation, not $300. The price at the moment is $22.50, the average price. So this is a huge thing. As a result, a wonderful testament to the man's vision, 12 million people in the world can see who would otherwise be blind. But I think you can also see this model is transferable. This fellow is called the Henry Ford of heart surgery. Devi Shetty in India basically runs a chain of hospitals, a very successful entrepreneur, but what he's also done is take the same model, but apply it to knee replacement, hip replacement, and then some rather complex operations, including heart bypass surgery. In each case, the models come straight from the Henry Ford textbook. Mohammed and I will have grown up teaching this stuff in operations management. It's basic stuff applied in a very different world, what Andrew Hargaden calls recombinant innovation. So, this idea of recombining knowledge, moving it around, becomes a hugely powerful opportunity in this space. And a challenge then for universities who are to some extent guardians of knowledge. What are we sitting on that people aren't actually using that might have relevance beyond the places <coughs> we would normally assume that to happen? Okay, my third area, and these are all complementary strategies around which organizations are experimenting, is co-creation. And essentially, this challenges our assumptions about the consumer. Um, this is uh, a Model T Ford, but with one small exception. You might notice, if you look more closely, uh, there we go, this particularly enterprising farmer has nailed a few planks together and now can take his goat to market. So it's a cattle transporter. And this farmer says, you know, I never use the back seats anyway, so I'll throw them out and now I can pull a load of hay and take it out to the fields. And I really like this. The engineer, engineer in me likes this. Model T Fords had iron wheels when they first came off the production line. Imagine in the Midwest of the US in winter, it gets snowy. Iron wheels are useless. 
So this farmer said, well, what I really need is a Model T snowmobile. Now, these are not photoshopped. These are all real photos, and it's something we know farmers do extremely well. Farmers essentially are classic examples of improvisers. They want the thing to do a job. They're not afraid to get their hands dirty, tinkering and fiddling. It doesn't have to be perfect. They're classic examples of what Eric von Hippel calls user innovators. And that's a really important strength. We know for many, many years this happens. Users come up with ideas because it solves their problem. They're not trying to make a fortune. They just want their problem solved. Actually, others can benefit from that as well. If you look at the number of pickup trucks around Oxford, never mind in the country, never mind in the world, it's a huge segment of the automotive industry, and it wasn't invented in Detroit. What happened was that businessmen driving into the car factories kept noticing farmers doing this and thinking, hmm, maybe there's a product there. So they refined, that's the thing they can bring, something the farmers had already developed as an idea, and the rest is history. Uh, it doesn't, of course, just happen in farming. There are many sectors. We know in the medical world this happens a lot. Specialists are very good at prototyping, coming up with their own ideas, which then become the medical techniques and instruments that others can use. The extreme version of that, of course, is the patients themselves doing something. And this gentleman's a good example. Um, characteristics of user innovators, they have a high incentive to innovate. They want the solution and they're not afraid to experiment. This guy had a high incentive to innovate. He was dying. He basically got a heart defect. The doctor said, well, look, we know what the problem is. We don't have a particularly good operation. There's a risk to this, but you've got a survival chance. So he's got a high incentive to do something different. And he's an engineer. And he said, well, what the hell? So he designed and then persuaded a surgeon to implant a new valve. Thankfully, he's still alive. It worked. There's a wonderful TED talk, so do have a listen to him and tell his own story. But as a result, not only is he alive, but many, many others are alive, benefiting from his ideas. This is the idea of what Eric von Hippel calls free innovation. Somebody does it to solve their problem, and it spreads more widely. Uh, there's a great website, if you have a chance, called Patient Innovation. Some Portuguese colleagues of mine, and this is a, using this premise to say, well, actually, there are lots of people, particularly living with chronic diseases, patients and carers, who are trying to make life work. Imagine that awful disease, cystic fibrosis. You can't breathe. Your lungs are clogged up. The only treatment is to keep getting sort of stimulus on your back. Now, that's a problem people live with, and they don't just live with it. They improvise, experiment, they innovate. And what patient innovation does is say, well, your solution might benefit others as well. So it's a wonderful example of mobilizing user innovation. But of course, we already know this. Any of our smartphones, whatever brand you've got, are running on Linux. And Linux is not the product of the Linux corporation. Linux is essentially a bunch of frustrated users. Just as the farmers were frustrated and wanted something, so Linus Torvald and all the others who joined his community basically said, there must be a better solution. And it continues to be a community of innovators, user innovators, primarily concerned not with making money, but with solving a problem that annoys them. So there's a huge amount in that space, and certainly in the world I'm involved in, the humanitarian space, there's a lot of user input we're realizing it's important. So, a uh, very, very brief example, um, in Haiti there was a terrible earthquake in 2010. One of the things that characterized it as a really important sort of keynote for the sector was at that time the city was absolutely in ruins, everything as you imagine in disasters. However, Vodafone quickly could get a functioning cellular system up and running. Stick a mast up and you can soon have a telecoms network in the sky. And most people had access to a mobile phone. They didn't all own one, but most people had some access. What happened in days was people, users, writing all sorts of apps to run across this network. How do you reunite displaced people? When an earthquake strikes, it happens suddenly, and your kids might be at school the other side of town. How do you find out where they are? How do you know which roads are possible or not? How do you move money around so the economy can start to function? All of these things and many others can be done on that platform. But the power of it was particularly users solving problems in their own context and sharing them. So it's a really rich resource for organizations. Very briefly, I'm conscious of the time. Um, experimenting. 
Now, we've got a, a, an ethos these days all about agile innovation. Businesses need to be entrepreneurial. Part of being an entrepreneur is failure. And we kind of get this, but we're still not very good at managing it. But it, sense, it sets up a culture which is, innovation is about experiment. A uh, wonderful book, I won't go into detail, but a wonderful book talking about the history of Pixar. If you think of motion pictures, Pixar have been one of the most successful innovators. Most of their movies have gone on to be really great, from the early Toy Story right through to today's. But essentially, they continue to innovate. But this isn't just by accident and having talented people. This is hugely about a culture of intelligent failure, managing the process of experimentation. Um, and Jeff Catmull, who has written the book, basically makes some useful comments. It wasn't until I finished Toy Story I realized failure is a healthy part of the process. Discovery, you don't know the answers before you start. So by definition, you're going to break a few eggs as you try and make that omelet. Um, so you want to encourage play, messing around, the kind of things which are not about organized R&D so much as experimentation. And we're now, as researchers and others, realizing this. Lots of books about serious play, experimentation matters, and so on. The question, of course, is how do we enable that kind of experimental culture, particularly in some of our more established organizations? And where do we do it? Um, oh, that's interesting. And that really moves on, so and the, the where, do it, where do we do it question, amongst other things, suggests there might be an interesting role for universities. As I followed your wonderful signpost coming in here, I walked past, I think, the glass lab or something. But this notion of labs is becoming not just a fashion item, potentially that becomes one of the safest spaces in which organizations might experiment. But let me come back to that in a moment. The last point I want to really put on this list of strategies, we're beginning to think again about platforms. Platforms as a way of maximizing the return on our knowledge investment. Now, platform thinks is very interesting. There's a lot of, it's a very fashionable item in our research literature at the moment. But it isn't just about two-sided markets. There's something much more fundamental about the way in which knowledge can be used and reused. If you think of <coughs> platforms, they become what I call sort of intersection points where knowledge, knowledge junctions, if you like, or take another metaphor, they're wellsprings which are bubbling over with possibilities. Um, it's essentially the point where knowledge gets changed, uh, gets shared, gets traded, gets moved around. It's the, the realization of that knowledge flow that I mentioned earlier on. And essentially enabling this kind of knowledge flow can not only be good business, but may also be a really rich opportunities for players in the kind of in, uh, ecosystem we're talking about in this conference. Um, you've got very simple <coughs> examples of this. Of course, we've, for a long time in product innovation, talked about knowledge platforms. And Lego would be a great example. Lego essentially is a platform, a physical platform from which so many reuses become possible still. Um, way, way back in the world, I love tractors, but in the world of tractors, the Ferguson system, the Massey Ferguson, the Ferguson part was essentially you connect the engine of the tractor, which is chugging away off and doing nothing, to all sorts of stuff you hook on on the back. It was a way of systems thinking around all the tools a farmer might need. And there's lots of other examples of systems thinking. Go into IKEA and then think about the systems thinking, the reuse of knowledge about how you join things together and so on. It's classic platform thinking around products. But we're now beginning to see the power of creating platforms where people can open-endedly share knowledge. So many of those platforms I've talked about in the crowdsourcing world are now interactive. And there's a huge growth inside organizations on col internal collaboration platforms, where organizations are bringing the suggestion scheme into the 21st century, mobilizing the input and ideas of their employees in open-ended fashion, not just to improve quality, but to actually innovate in new directions. And we're beginning to see a huge growth in knowledge communities as platforms. Linux would be a good example, but managing the community as a platform around which and from which knowledge can flow becomes a really powerful complementary resource to our existing innovation approaches. And that raises the question of knowledge spaces. Uh, Alan Hughes at Cambridge writes a lot about the role of universities, not just as places where you spin off the great new ideas, or even the places where we educate people who carry our knowledge. They are also conveners of spaces, which can, or curators of spaces, in which can, where knowledge can actually interact, can perform in this platform fashion. 
Um, that, of course, isn't a new idea. This is a, a coffee shop. This is a Starbucks uh, circa 1700 uh, in the city of London. Um, this was actually Mr. Brown's coffee shop. And Mr. Brown's coffee shop eventually became the London Stock Exchange. Basically, it's a place where people came together, had a cup of coffee, had a chat, and kicked their ideas around in a comfortable, open environment. Mr. Lloyd's coffee shop, a little around the corner, was the place where the maritime people used to go. And Lloyd's of London, this huge shipping and insurance thing, essentially owes its origins to a coffee shop. This idea of knowledge spaces. The Wagon Wheel Bar in Silicon Valley in the sort of early, uh, late 70s was another place where this happened. That's where so much of the IT revolution was born, over beers after work in a, in a bar. And this idea of creating a space where that can happen also ties up with my earlier point about prototyping and experiment. Can we create safe spaces where it's okay to fail? Where you can try risky stuff, where bring interesting things together? And big companies hire this huge Chinese white goods company, GE, BMW, do this kind of thing in very specific locations, not just for themselves, but essentially as open doors. So the higher one in Beijing is essentially a place where they invite young students to come and sit alongside their engineers to kick stuff around. In Munich, BMW do the same thing run by the Technical University. These two at the bottom are, for me, rather interesting because they're quite proactive things done by universities. Um, Garage 33, uh, I work a lot with a very large German company called Heller. If you look at most cars outside, there's an 80% chance the headlights are made by Heller. But more importantly, they're huge in driverless car automation, all the technology you'll need in that driverless car. <coughs> Heller is 120 years old, I've just written a book about them, and Heller is a very old established company who realized that their deep knowledge is both their strength and their weakness. They need to experiment and bring in very different knowledge sets, but to do so safely. So the University of Paderborn has opened Garage 33 to create exactly that kind of space where companies can interact with students, where they can have startups. It's essentially a sort of a, a garage kind of culture. But it's a place deliberately designed by the university as a space where this kind of experimentation can happen. A byproduct is it pulls huge amounts from the university. But it was deliberately designed. And Josephs, if you go down to Nuremberg, wonderful old German city, Josephs is right in the city center. It's like an Apple store. There's a lovely coffee shop, and you can go in and have coffee and so on. But you can also see all sorts of interesting new service innovations at a prototype stage. And the idea is, as you come off the street and have your coffee, you play with this and you react to it. Oh, this is rubbish. I'd never use this. Great. That's useful knowledge. Or, wow, this is great. How do I find out more? This is a joint venture between the uh, Friedrich Alexander University and the Fraunhofer Institute, the institute that gave you the MP3 player. So they're rather concerned with this. But they're basically using this as a deliberate probe in the center of a city, not tucked away on a campus somewhere, trying to create a space. OK, uh, one last comment, and then I'm going to shut up. Um, this, of course, is all about multiple models, and there are many others. I've just given you a few ways in which organizations are adding to their core innovation models. Uh, but it raises a big question. How on earth do you join them all together? And particularly, all this experimental wow stuff that goes on over here, how does that fit with the mainstream in the organization? And we have this wonderful phrase, ambidexterity in the literature, but it's a very real problem. I come back again to my wonderful company, Heller. It's a great business, but there's a huge tension now. Two years ago, they started doing this Garage 33, and they set up in Silicon Valley in Berlin. There's this wonderful, vibrant mini company or companies doing stuff in very different ways, hitting this brick wall of 120 years of, we have always done it this way. It's a real challenge. How do we manage that interplay between so that everyone benefits from it? And that, of course, is as much true inside organizations like public sector, like universities, as it is inside large companies. OK, I will stop. Let me just summarize where I've tried to be, and hopefully it's given us a start. Um, of course, innovation matters. You wouldn't be here if you didn't care. Um, but it's going to need active management. We can't simply trust to luck. And these days, we've got a systems challenge. This is a multiplayer game, and it's interconnected. 
So we've got to be talking about systems. We can't think of individual actors. So this idea of universities acting independently or business, it just doesn't play that way. Um, we need, and I think that's a key message I stress, innovation model innovation. And in a sense, the question, this dynamic capability, is always, of the things we're doing, which ones work? Which ones do we need more of? Because they're really good. Which ones maybe do we need less of? They worked in the past, but maybe we'll turn those down or turn them off. And which new things do we need to bring on stream? And that's the classic sort of, for me, formulation for dynamic capability. Continuing reflection around this. So it's all about dynamic capability. It's all about learning new tricks. So I started with the children's author. Let me finish with one. Uh, this is my great favorite. Uh, if you don't recognize it, this is Winnie the Pooh. Pre-Walt Disney, this is 1920. Ernest Shepard drew these wonderful drawings for A.A. A. Milne's book. But the very first Winnie the Pooh book, for me, says something profound about the challenge of learning. Here you have Edward Bear, which is Winnie the Pooh's proper name. Here you have Edward Bear coming downstairs now, bump, 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 on the back of his head, behind Christopher Robin, which is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs, except that sometimes he feels there really is another way, if only he could stop bumping for a moment to think of it. I think it's wonderful. I have that above my desk as a sort of reminder, but it also is relevant for the world of conference, because most of us, most of our daily lives, are bumping our heads in all sorts of ways. The beauty of this is we've got a couple of days where we're offline, and we've got the added bonus, not just to have some thinking time, but to be able to interact with very different people. So I hope the conference goes well. It's got some great papers in there. I hope this has given you a little bit of food for thought. If you want to follow up on any of the things I've been talking about, I've caught, I've caught up with the 21st century. I write a blog now, which I quite enjoy doing, not least because it's not peer-reviewed. <laughs> um, we also have our innovation portal, which um, basically has lots of the cases I've talked about. But anyway, you're very welcome to tap into any of that. But for now, thank you very much. Thanks, John. For uh, what I think about Dyson, first of all, is it, it, it's in the line of experiments. It's not saying this is the way to do it. It's the way we do it. Very much, I think, they're influenced by the, the founder. I mean, Dyson is a, a fascinating... In, inventor, entrepreneur, he's got a particular philosophy. Um, for me, quite a lot of technology push, but he's actually sort of, I think, bumped into enough of the marketplace. So there is some of that design thinking and his, his links to the Royal College of Art sort of bring some of that in as well. So he's got a model. Uh, I think what he's trying to do with that, now particularly moving into this university space, is create um, uh, an experimental space which will work, he thinks, for more than just Dyson. He's obviously trading on things that have worked for him. It's not the only model, but in a sense, I would encourage more of that. Go back to my Hire and BMW and some of those other companies. I think there's, a, there's an appetite amongst companies to get engaged with not simply being consumers, but to actually create new ways of interacting, um, to create new ways to train people, to create new ways to access knowledge, to share their knowledge. So I guess... Um, I think it's probably early days for some of what he's been doing in terms of his, uh, his approach. But um, as an experiment to watch, I think it's very interesting. So perhaps he's coming back towards your, your, your uh, view of the future. Yes, I think, <laughs> I don't know the man, but I think he has a very clear vision, like a, a, a lot of people, like Branson and some of these other entrepreneurs. He's able, with the resources, to make something happen. Um, I think... I'd like to think he was also prepared to learn from failure. And I say that advisedly because one of the case studies of um, uh, persistence in creativity, one of the, the key personality traits is persistence. Dyson didn't just invent his bag, bag, bagless cleaner. There was 5,000 prototypes and five years of failure. So I'd hope he's somebody who knows about learning from failure and pivoting. That would be my hope for it. Thank you. Foreman? John, um, I just would like, would like to have a about uh, what safe place for exchange. I think uh, working with you, I have learned from you that uh, whenever we want to in implement an innovation, we have to seek, look at what are the main conditions for its successful implementation. And I would like to give you two ex uh, cases I have, um, have um, uh, experienced. One is interviewing um, 
mid 90s uh, successful manager from construction, <coughs> looking at innovation in construction. And he was used, his company was used for benchmarking. Uh, it, it was benchmarked against uh, all the world. And we said, I said to him, aren't you aware about revealing what is you know, your um, competitive edge, you know, your knowledge? And he said, no, I'm not, because I know I am ahead of them, three years ahead of them. So by the time they learn what I am doing, the, I will be somewhere else in terms of knowledge. The second example is a manager of an IT company, very sex successful IT company, which was involved on open innovation and came to us and said, we would like you to work with us on trying to see how we can uh, better um, implement open innovation because the issue of intellectual property is actually preventing open innovation from flying. Mm -hmm. So on the basis of the, these two examples, I'd like to have your views on, on open space. I, I think it's a really great example because we, toy, we throw these words around, you know, experiment and fail, that's good, we should do lots of that. That's a real threat, especially to an established organization. Uh, let's open everything up and share and all. That's a real risk if you risk opening up and giving away your intellectual property. So I think there's a lot of experimentation around how we can create safe spaces. I'll give a couple of examples. One would be, if you take that intellectual property, um, there's a very nice organization called 100% Open. You've got a great website. But they're essentially brokers. They've been working in this open innovation space. And they talk about the airlock. Now, you know the science fiction movies. The airlock's the place between the main spaceship, where you can walk around and breathe air, and outer space, which is not a good place to be without oxygen. The airlock's that kind of insulated, safe environment in between. And what 100% Open try and do is to take two players in the situation you describe and create a safe space within which they can talk with ground rules and, and protection. And I think that's a powerful metaphor for the kind of thing we need to find ways of working. If you take another version of it, which is the prototyping, um, in the humanitarian sector, um, we need innovation. I stress that, and we need radical innovation. This is a sector which has a real problem of being rather incremental. It believes, first of all, this is donated money, so we have to spend it very wisely and carefully. So we tend to do more of what we've done in the past. We do things a bit better, which is fine, except that many of the challenges out there require radical innovation. But radical innovation, the classic prescription is experiment and fail. Except you can't do that with people who are vulnerable in a desperate situation. It's just not that simple. It's not right. So how do you deal with that? And that's a big question that the sector's been engaging with. They began playing with labs. Oh, everyone's doing a lab, let's have some labs. So UNICEF have had some very interesting labs. What has gradually emerged is, no, we've got to be more clever about this. We actually need to find really safe, safe in the literal way, quarantined ways in which we can do this experimenting without putting people at risk, um, and then transfer those lessons across effectively to the mainstream. Uh, and there are things you can do with simulation in that. There are things you can do in contexts which are not extreme before then the earthquake or something happened. So there are ways of doing it, but it's a learning process. But I think for me, this is one of the, th one of the challenges altogether. We have a kind of fashion-based industry around innovation. Somebody comes up with a wonderful new thing. Oh, let's have labs. And everyone's on the bandwagon. I'm old enough to remember science parks. That was how universities would survive in the future. Of course, not many of them had the kind of configuration that Cambridge has or that um, uh, MIT in Route 128 has. Not many places have that. So the science part, just as a plug and play, is going to fail. Adapting your models has taken us sort of 30 years, and now we're, we're getting better. So we've got to be careful of the fashion. So we need the safe spaces, but we've still got to learn how to create them um, in ways that work for the job we're trying to do. So it's a bit of a long answer, but I think it's an important area. Thank you. Uh, I think we need to uh, close this close the session. I think we have overrun. Before I uh, end, uh, can I just point out that Oxford actually has the oldest running coffee house, the Queensland That's Coffee right. House. That's right. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think it was established in 1654. It claims to be the oldest running coffee house in Europe. Didn't they call them Penny University? Yes, so the, 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 yeah. the, the, the term Penny University is actually originates from, from that particular coffee house. That's fascinating. All right. Thank you. Can I ask the audience to...